Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 246, featuring the third installment of my interview with Mr. Robert Sirotech of Surtech Software. This part of the interview, we talk about Wizardry 1 through 5, uh, Brenda Brathwaite, uh, now known as Brenda Romero, uh, Andrew Greenberg, Robert Woodhead, and uh, David Bradley. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Sirotech. So you were the man responsible for taking Wizardry from these you're basically being sold through direct mail, right, to really big distributors. Well. Right, and, and the idea of this box, shrink wrap box, also was huge. Um, and uh, people were were advertising. I know that Broderbund and Sierra Online uh, and Sirius Software were already advertising in Soft Talk magazine, which was the book of choice by far. Um, and... Uh, and by the by the way, I don't know. Let me just throw this in: the Soft Talk, which is a wonderful magazine on the early history of the video game industry, is being reincarnated, kind of, uh, by all of the issues being digitized under the Soft Talk project. That's what it's called. If you do a search on the net, you'll find it. So people seeing this interview will know about this. They can go check out some of the early players in the industry and there are actual digital copies of these magazines now online but anyway that was the we were advertising we were putting stuff in a box we had distribution channels so we started to get very formal about creating demand building good product putting it in the street in plentiful quantities so that we'd have the visibility to sell product through and that was we were one of the first players to do that along with broderbund and uh and see her online. Yeah. All right. So, what roles did the people, or did everyone involved uh, in play in, in Wizardry? It's you know, it's been credited uh, to Robert Woodhead and Andrew Greenberg. So, how did those two divvy up the, and what role did you play in the development? Well, Ro Robert Woodhead did the lion's share of the work. He was the coder. He did a whole lot of design work. I pay a lot of credit to Robert. Um, he, he was the one that produced, uh, the product originally in basic Andrew Greenberg, uh, had more of a, uh, hands-off approach to this. It was more, um, on and off. He wasn't there every day. Like Robert was working on this product. Uh, but the advice that Andrew provided when Robert got stuck with certain gnarly issues uh, was solid. And I know that this product is better because of Andrew's input as infrequent as it was. So, you know, that his involvement was worth it. My, my role in this, as well as my brother's role, uh, when we were only a three-person company, was basically, you know, ripping into the product and criticizing it, playing it to make sure that there were no bugs, making sure that the human interface design was intuitive and, and logical, given the constraints that we had technically with the hardware at the time. Uh, our goal was just to create a product as fun as it could be. And I remember late night sessions where I would find a bug and the computer would bing, you know, there would be a bell or something that would go off because I, I would trip up the computer and it would hang. And Robert was working in the room next to me and, and all I'd hear him say was, oh, bleep, not again, <laughs> you know, something like that. So. So we were able to get rid of a lot of the bugs and bring it to market in a pretty good state of form. So that was my role. And then, of course, when the product was launched, everything changed. Uh, we, we hired people to take on those parts that I've just discussed, that what, what Norman and I did. 
And uh, Norman started pursuing more of an operational role in the company. Uh, I started maintaining my my role as sales and marketing. Um, and then as years went on, uh, I brought on a sales guy and brought on some marketing people. And I started looking at um, finding you know, other products to bring on board. So I'd negotiate deals with authors. I'd help capitalize those developments. Um, uh, so, you know, that that's, you know, our, our roles kind of diversified and became more segmented. Just to bring a couple other players on the stage here, I think we also had Brenda uh, Brathwaite hired at this time and Linda Curry. That's right. So, so what were they like? <laughs> Brenda was special. She's, uh, I took her under my wing as though she was my sister. Linda is my sister. And that's how they met through my sister and Brenda met. Uh, they were in high school at the time. They were both brought on to handle hotline. So when people bought our product and if they got stuck, one of the things that we provided was to give people a chance to figure, to, to go to somebody, to come to the company and for help. So we felt that was that, that the customer service was very important. And we did everything. We were up until crazy hours with hotline support. And Brenda and Linda did that. Uh, and uh, Brenda, Brenda's really special. She's, she's very bright, uh, very passionate about her work. And, um, and so she worked her way through from hotline work into uh, doing scripting for the products um and um as well as linda they all became designers of video games and uh um, so we had we pretty well you know for many many years we didn't want to have an in-house development company but as things started to evolve in the industry uh, we saw the need that we had to start a development company and when we did that's when linda and brenda both did their design work and, and and script work and all the other things that they that we had to do to create good product. So it was nobody at Certech that I was saying, well, these are women; they don't, they can't do this Heck work. No, no, we encouraged it. I think women in the industry are very important. They're half our population. If you expect to cater to them and sell product to women, then you better have some of your, some some design done by them. I, I completely support women in in video game in the video game industry completely. It's a, it's a great thing. So in 1982, we get Knights of Diamonds, uh, which I was uh, by all accounts a huge seller. Uh, so I wonder maybe talk a little bit about that. And also I'm curious about because it's reading about a little bit of. Uh, I don't know if controversy is probably too strong of a word, but you know a little disagreement at the company about uh, the role of importing characters. So should you have to play Wizardry 1 to play the second one, or is, could you just start from a fresh party? So maybe a little bit of, on that. Okay. Um, I was of the mind that those who wanted to play Knight of Diamonds shouldn't have be forced to go and buy buy the, the product beforehand. It's kind of like, why do I want to go buy a product that's been released on the street for a year or two? But the design of the product was such that it required it. And in hindsight, that was the way to go because people fell in love with their characters. And that brought passion to the product. One of the things that we all said we wanted to do from a product philosophy were, were to stir the passions of the players that played our games, to make people happy, to make people cry, to just really, you know, like a good movie will do that. And I think we achieved that because when these characters died off through some ugly encounter, oh, I remember some of the letters that we got saying, oh, my character, I can't regurgitate it here for you, but it, it was, the, these were impassioned letters saying we need to get our, our characters back. Can you do that? And of course we could. 
And we did. And we sent it back to them, much to their happiness. So it was... <laughs> yeah, I remember a lot of... You know, you could go all the way down to the bottom of this dungeon and get an attack. You'd have one character left with a couple of hit points, right? And if you didn't get all the way back to the top... And I guess then at that point you're on the phone with Brenda, yeah. right? Talking. <laughs> oh, I remember those days too. I, uh, yeah, it was a long way down to the tenth level now, wasn't it? And you're there with your character with a few hit points. The last thing you want to do is trace all the way back up, right? Oh, I remember that too. So 1983. That's the legacy of. You might have to help me with the pronunciation on this one. Little little gammon, yeah. little game, little little yeah. gammon. Uh, so how did that one go over? <laughs> well, it didn't go over to start with very well because there was a typo in that spelling. Nobody knows this. There are two L's in little gammon. There should have only been one. <laughs> and Robert found out well after the fact. Uh, he had a fit over this. Um. Anyway. Uh, Little, Wiz, Legacy of Logomon was delayed by a year because it used the Windows wizardry technology. We went from a, th a thin wire diagram in the upper right corner of the screen to full screen video using wires, of course, wireframes, because that's all the technolo technology could, could support. Remember also around that time frame, the Macintosh was just released. So Windows was really the cat's meow. Uh, and we decided, well, let's try and emulate that on the Apple II, which for us was still selling, was the number one uh, computer platform for sales for us. So we wanted to try and emulate the Windows um, framework for a video game on the Apple II. And I think that took a lot of time for us to build it, but it was successful. I think people really enjoyed it and it rejuvenated the product in the third sequel. If it weren't for that, we would have knocked it out six months after, because one of the things we did was separate the system architecture from running the video game from the database that had the content. And we could manipulate the database content quickly through these editors. So all we needed was a good storyboarder and a good uh, script writer and create some puzzles and bang, we were, we were done. We didn't have to recode stuff. So it was modu very modularized coding at that time. Back in, well, when we released the product, this was the design. I wonder if that's the, you know, if this design opened up, I'm getting a bit of an echo here. Uh, if that design opened up the way to have this program called Wiz Plus, I don't know if you remember that, these uh, wizardry editors I guess people were using to make their characters super strong. And I was uh, reading that you guys really, really hated these, you know, editors, especially this one, I guess, because this was actually sold as a commercial product. And uh, one of the ways you deal with it is if the people sent you discs that uh, had been tampered with with the editor, you would uh, refuse to, to mess with them, right? That's right. I mean, obviously people didn't like it. And we made it very clear that we didn't like Wiz Plus or any other products like it being uh, sold or given away. Now the question is why? It destroyed the integrity of the game. If you were to pump up your characters and make them invincible and go around trashing monsters, what pleasure is that? You don't really take away the kind of experience that we wanted you to have buying our products. Why is that important? Because then people would say, this product is garbage. Well, of course it's garbage. If you're using pumped up mega characters, you're not gonna enjoy the, the, the product as it was meant to be. That's why we didn't like it. Not because other people were making money, although that make us, didn't make us very happy either. But nevertheless, that's not the reason why we didn't like it. We didn't like it because people who were using it weren't having the play experience that we wanted them to have. So, yeah, I, I feel the same way. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, they didn't. I don't understand. Even today, why do people uh, want to use these editors? I've used. I used it once on one game, 
and it so tarnished my my enjoyment for the reasons that you mentioned, right? That once you remove the challenge, it's just a boring game. So I had to wait enough years for me to forget uh, <laughs> enough of the game. Went back, played it without it, and a whole lot more fun. Yeah. But anyway, let's talk about uh, Return of Wordna in 1987, a notorious game for its difficulty. And also a complete reversal from these other wizardry, wizardry games, right? Because now you're in control of the, the evil guy. As far as I know, that's got to be one of the only computer role-playing games that put that, you know designed that way. I mean, I guess you could talk about uh, some of the dungeon uh, dungeon creation kind of games. But I just, you know, what was uh, going on behind the scenes with the return of uh, Wordna? Well, um... It is one of the few video games out there that, at that time anyway, when we launched it, where the player actually played the, the evil guy, the bad guy. Um, it's also known to be the hardest game in the marketplace, even to this day. It was insanely difficult to win that game. I had such issues with that. I felt that it went way beyond what was necessary in terms of complexity. But the people that developed it, were, that were involved in the, in the design of it, felt strongly to leave a mark in the industry that they had the hardest game to play, period, bar none. You know, that's fine if you're not worried about catering to a customer and making sales for the sake of the, for, for, for the, sake of the product, right? So it, I'll tell you now that Return of Wordna was our worst-selling product we ever launched. Ever released. Oh, wow, worst, really? Absolutely. People would buy it, and it was unplayable. So they, they put it down, and obviously word of mouth spread around. There wasn't the Internet then, so it took a while for word of mouth to spread around, but it did. Uh, there were other hardcore players in the market that loved it, that said, I, oh, why doesn't everybody do this? Well, we don't because you, you guys, the hardcore players, are a minority. If you are gluttons for punishment, you're going to have to get your pleasure somewhere else <laughs> because nobody can survive catering to a, such a small number of people. So it, it was controversial in that way. In the end, I think I was proven correct that building crazy impossible products in terms of difficulty was not the way forward. And that's when... David Bradley arrived on the scene with Wizardry 5, we made sure that we got off this kick about producing the world's hardest video game products to play. So just a quick little trivia question I would like to clear it up about uh, Wordna. So is it true that some of the characters in that game were actually salvaged from the discs uh, that you guys received from players over the years? It is true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, did you get letters from people that found their, their party? We did. And I'm sure not everybody has discovered this. And maybe now that we've got this on your video and you're in this interview, we'll find people going back and playing it and saying, hey, there's my character. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Huh? I think that was a great tribute to our customers. And that's why we did it. We wanted to acknowledge their fan loyalty and their um, just we wanted to pay them a little bit of a tribute, which which we did in this way. Just can't imagine the shock a player must have felt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that looks familiar. Oh. We did that with a number of our products uh, going forward too. Uh, we did that in Jagged Alliance as well, and uh, a whole bunch of stuff where we started putting our fans' characters in there. That's really yeah. cool. Uh, so we've already mentioned the fifth one, Heart of the yeah. Maelstrom. So how did you know? What's the story with David W. Bradley? How did he get involved? David is a brilliant guy. I have tremendous respect for him. Um, he he submitted product to another company, uh, Avalon Hill, I think. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Well, I guess he had a video. <laughs> anyway. Um, he submitted a company. He submitted it to another company, and they had uh, said, "Well, I don't know that we can compete with Surtex, so maybe you should take this product, which is really good, 
and, and submit it to CERTEC to see what they have to say. Well, that's what he did. And we loved it. Uh, it was submitted under the name of Dragon's Breath. That was the name of the product that he gave it. And uh, we looked at it and we said, hmm, we think we can readapt this and bring it into the Wizardry franchise. And after some talk with David, he agreed that that was the right move it, because the trademark really had such carrying weight in the industry at that point. It was a well-developed mark. Uh, so he recoded everything under UCSD Pascal. He lives in it at the time he lived in Atlanta and he flew up and spent many, many, many months in Ithaca, New York, where our development was now occurring and um, spent a great deal of time with Robert Woodhead uh, migrating the code from what he had. I think it was C, I don't know if it was C plus or if it was just C into UCSD Pascal and um, change some of the systems around to make it hook into the earlier wizardries. He worked really hard. So uh, that was that was Heart of Maelstrom, and that was our first uh, time that we met and we started working together. We got along really well. I found David to be a very deep thinker. He also was one of the first in Wizardry 6 to create not only the fantasy, like fantasy games were all fantasy, but they didn't have any science fiction elements to it. David was, was by far the first to introduce the sci-fi nature in a fantasy role-playing game. And that was in number six. He's a deep thinker. You could see it in his product design, in his, uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the storyboards that you see and the characters itself were, were really quite philosophical. There are reasons for that because of what he studied and so on. He was also a classical musician and took great pleasure in playing uh, piano. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, I just, I just, I really like David, he's a great guy. So what was going on with Robert Woodhead at the time? Was he eager to pass on the torch? Is he kind of dis becoming disillusioned with the franchise? Yeah, he'd been working on it for almost 10 years. He decided to pursue another, um, uh, just another vocation, another, um, career. Uh, he ended up in Japan and um, married a girl in Japan. Uh, and uh, today he's uh, producing, uh, he's back in the States, he's producing anime uh, translations for uh, cartoon anime, Japanese anime. He's doing quite well at it, I understand. that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that should be back next week with part four of my interview with mr robert serious heck and believe me guys <laughs> you don't want to miss part four of this i'll just leave it at that uh, as always i want to thank you very very much if you have supported me in the matt chat show uh, i really appreciate it guys and i understand that you know not everybody has a lot of money for something like this but uh, whatever you feel comfortable with and uh, whatever you think the show is worth I really appreciate your support. If you'd like to support me, I just go to the Patreon site. There's a link in the show notes. It only takes a couple of minutes. It's really easy to set up. It's actually fun. You might want to check out some of the other stuff there. Uh, but one of the upsides is you get this uh, access to the Google Air Hangouts every month. And that's just a, you know, if you support the show at any level, you can come there and hang out with us, drink some ales and talk about games. And there's also a, a monthly uh, audio slash video podcast haven't quite figured out the how the audio part of this yet. Uh, but, you know, it's over an hour long uh, where I'm talking about games and the recent episodes uh, with some of my friends. So, uh, you know, you might like that too. Okay, let's see. News from the Matt Cave. Uh, Eric Fraga, or Fraga writes in with a link to his uh, YouTube channel. He's a Brazilian fan of Matt Chat, and apparently he is known as the Matt Chat of Brazil. So I thought that was worth... Uh, telling you guys about. If you speak Portuguese, or maybe even if you don't, you might want to check out his channel. Uh, this is Eric Frege. Uh, Stick Johansson wrote in uh, to tell me about a free uh, role-playing game book called The Player's Primer of Arc from Ravenlore Press. 
I know a lot of you guys are into the pen and paper tabletop role playing game stuff. Uh, I personally don't know very much about it, but I thought I'd just uh, mention this in case you wanted to uh, check it out yourself. And then also, of course, the GOG, good old games, uh, they have a, a massive uh, summer sale going on right now. Are you really going <laughs> to you're going to be very disappointed with yourself if you don't go check it out because the deals there are just incredible. I, you know, just as I'm posting this video, they have an, an Ultima sale. You get one through nine plus uh, both of the Ultima Underworlds. All of that only for seven bucks. I mean, I, it's crazy. Uh, they also have Deus Ex, Wizardry 8, and uh, an adventure game series they're called Jack Keen. Uh, that I'm quite keen on, so go check that out. Uh, just remember, don't go directly to GOG.com from your browser. I look for the GOG link in my show notes, and that way uh, I'll get a little bit of a kickback. It won't cost you anything extra, but you can support the show that way. Uh, so thank you very much, guys, uh, for that, too. Plus, I think you really enjoy those games, uh, more importantly. All right, what about that Ale of the Week? Ah, well, this week I've got a Mighty Arrow Pale Ale. Pretty cool name, I think. Uh, this is from the New Belgian Brewing Company out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Pretty well-known uh, brewery. They do the uh, Fat Tire. Uh, you've probably seen that before. Uh, this one is supposed to be a, let's see, what do they have here? Cascade Amarillo Golden, Golden Hops Fetching Honey Malt Base. This is our beloved tribute to Arrow, Kim's Aussie Border Collie Mix, who ran New Belgium for 12 years. When she wasn't patrolling the brewery grounds, she was famous for her office visits. She never met a tummy rub she didn't like. <laughs> oh, nice, nice story there. Uh, Six percent alcohol, so not too bad. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this mighty arrow here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this. You definitely smell the hops in this. This will probably be uh, quite bitter, which is uh, fine by me. Really nice. Not a really overpowering aroma or anything, but you definitely smell the uh, the hops here. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Mm. Well, that is definitely bitter. Uh, some quite nice uh, flavors, though. You, you taste a bit of a honey, a bit of a sweetness uh, to this. A nice uh, nutty flavor to this. Uh, quite flavorful. I really enjoy that. Let me try it again. Yeah, just a really good pale ale here. This uh, <laughs> this mighty era. I don't see how you can go wrong with this if you like the pale ale uh, flavor. Um, nice thick. Uh, you know the bitterness I was uh, worried about. It's not really that pronounced. Just bitter enough to. Uh, Add to the flavor without, you know, <laughs> becoming an issue, shall we say. Let me try it one more time. Yeah, just overall pretty good. I'm not going to say it's the best pale ale I've ever had or anything, but uh, on the other hand, I've had many worse pale ales. So I guess I'll go maybe three out of five, uh, very close to a four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, the Mighty Arrow. You know, I love the story about the dog, so why don't we just knock it up to four out of five <laughs> drinking ones on this. Uh, definitely quite a nice uh, pale ale. I like the the sort of honey flavor and the bitterness is just, you know, the right amount of bitterness to enhance uh, the flavor. So uh, four out of five horns for the Mighty Arrow. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, the quote, I was looking for quotes about disillusionment, and I found a really interesting one from Gertrude Stein. It goes something like this. Disillusionment in living is finding that no one can really ever agree with you completely about anything. I <laughs> know that feeling. See you guys next week. Windraiser!